Welcome to AUA Leadership in Business, an official podcast of the American Urological Association. Welcome to the AUA Leadership in Business podcast, where urologic professionals experience the practical application of business acumen essential for success in today's dynamic professional landscape. I'm Dr. Jennifer Miles Thomas. In today's episode, we will discuss leadership through service. Joining me today is Dr. Manoj Manga. Um, Dr. Manga is professor and chairman of the Department of Urology at the University of California, San Diego. From 2010 to 2020, he was director of the Stephen Stream Center for Endourology and Stone Disease at the Glickman Urologic, Urological and Kidney Institute of the Cleveland Clinic. Prior to this, he was the Joseph Sorkin's Professor and Vice Chair of Urology at the University of Minnesota. He specializes in endourology and stone disease. He was awarded the Endourology Society Arthur Smith Young Innovators Award in 2007 and has over 450 peer reviewed publications. In 2018, he was awarded the Ralph Kleiman Mentor Award by the Endourology Society. Dr. Munga served as Secretary of the American Urological Association from 2015 to 2019. He also served on the Board of Directors of the Endourology Society and on numerous AUA and AUA sectional committees, including the recent AUA guidelines panel for both medical therapy for nephrolithiasis and surgical therapy for nephrolithiasis. He was elected to the AAGUS, the American Association of Genital Urinary Surgeons in 2016. He is the past president of ROCS, the Research on Calculus Kinetics Society, and currently serves on the Board of Governors for the American College of Surgeons. Welcome, Dr. Munga. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for having me today, and thank you for your listeners. You are very welcome. Now, this is going to be exciting because we've talked to a bunch of leaders throughout who are at different points in their career, you have accomplished, you've, you've, you are a name in, in stone disease and you've done a lot and you've served a lot too. So if we're talking about leadership through service, who can be a leader? Well, Jennifer, I think we're all leaders in many facets of our life. Uh, we could start at home. We're all leaders at home with our families, with our friends, with our pets. Uh, trying to engage people in meaningful work and trying to help people reach where they'd like to be in their lives. And, uh, and so I think parents are leaders, brothers are leaders, moms are leaders. Uh, we're all leaders in different capacities at home. But then it extends to work and we can be leaders in clinic, in the OR, and even beyond that in organized medicine. And we can be leaders within our communities trying to elevate our communities in a variety of ways, whether it be through volunteerism or through advocacy. And then we can also be leaders globally through humanitarian work. So I think we can all be leaders in different facets of our lives. Some of us might excel in certain areas, whereas others excel in in different areas. So that makes that makes complete sense. I think a lot of times we don't recognize the, the, the unstructured leadership that we do on a daily basis. A lot of times we're looking for people to call us out as leaders or assign us a leadership position. But what you're saying is basically throughout our lives in all different personal as well as professional capacities, we have leadership roles and abilities. And so we need to think of ourselves as leaders in these in these other instances also. Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely correct. And I think, uh, unfortunately, many things in our day-to-day lives, whether it's pre-authorization for a medication or not being able to get a case scheduled in the OR, puts us in a sense of self-reflection that says, we're not leaders, we're followers. And, and uh, one of my friends outside of medicine said, you know, physicians really need to understand how well-respected they are in the community. And through that respect comes the opportunity to be powerful in our voices. uh, And it's a matter of choosing the right things to put our passion into. Completely agree, completely agree. Okay, so how would we become a leader? How does one become a leader? Uh, Well, I think becoming a leader to me is a bit vague in terms of how it happens. 
I think part of it is genetics, part of it is personality, uh, part of it is, and a huge part of it is role models. Um, so for myself, I would say probably my father was my first role model, an uh, academic physician who I could see really had a meaningful impact on so many people's lives just by providing a little touch here and there to help nurture someone's career or help them get to the type of care they needed. Mm -hmm. help, uh, the organizations, organizational structure at the VA where he focused his career. So, so all of these things my dad did without, I think, necessarily considering himself a leader or, or doing it for his own interests, but doing it uh, altruistically to try to help people in different ways. And I've had the good fortune of to learning from many leaders throughout my, my time uh, in medical school and residency in early and mid-career. Uh, and it is very helpful to, to pay attention to the different leadership styles and try to grasp the best of everyone that you meet. Um, so, so it's all, I think in, at least in my mind, it's been primarily, uh, you could say learning on the job. Um, though there's no question that leadership courses, uh, such as the AUA leadership course, as well as institutional leadership courses helps pr provide a foundation, uh, for interacting with people, um, for moving issues forward. Uh, it also provides an opportunity to develop a network of colleagues who may or may not be people within your own specialty area who you can touch bases with throughout your career, but in addition to being friends, being uh, um, colleagues who can provide advice at different times throughout your, your career. Um, so I think in a way we talk sometimes about continuous learning. Uh, that uh, certainly applies to the role as a leader. Um, I think one of the, the challenging parts is the self-reflection on being a leader. It's, it's like you don't think about your appearance unless you happen to pass by your mirror. And, uh, and the same thing goes for reflecting on being a leader. I don't really necessarily consider myself a leader because there are so many other people that I admire who are, I think are greater leaders than I could ever aspire to be. Um, but, but it's the times maybe a, on a holiday where a former fellow or resident contacts you and say, thinking about you 10 years later, that those are those little moments where one realizes the impact one has had an opportunity to make. And it's, it's so rewarding. Um, so. Yeah. Well, growing up, do you, when you were younger, do you think you recognized your father as a leader? Because obviously he's like set a great model of what leadership and, and servant leadership was. Do you think you recognized that when you were growing up or was it just something that was assumed and you just knew you would be doing the same? Yeah, well, I definitely appreciated what my dad did and, and my mom. She was also a, a leader in academic medicine. Um, I think it's been more recent on self-reflection where I look at what characteristics I have in common with my dad and how those might have been molded by watching and observing him. Uh, and I, I think it's it's also been more a reflection on my own path where I, I can appreciate looking back on his, how much of an impact he had on so many people. And I think that's important too, because not everyone has that that environment to grow up in to see modeling of true leadership. Um, and I am grateful that you are a servant leader and that people are watching you and people come back and said, thank you, because it's true. You never really know the impact that you make on people until much later. So people are watching us daily. They're watching what we do and what we say, and it is heartwarming to know that you made a difference. So thank you. Well, what do you think some of your favorite leadership roles have been? Well, I, I would probably come back to that last reflection is the students and the residents, the opportunity to mentor young individuals uh, and try to open doors and make a difference um, is very rewarding. And, uh, and so that would be my main, my, my number one uh, thing that I, I value uh, 
in terms of the doors that have been opened for me. Uh, I also value our patients and being able to empower them with the knowledge they need to not only make informed decisions, but also hopefully impact the course of their, of their disease. Uh, it's been great to watch my kids grow and flourish. And, and uh, for each of these, whether it's students, residents, patients, or kids, I end up learning as much from them as I think they do from me. Um, and, and then on the academic medicine side of things, uh, the, uh, the roles in terms of expanding into urology at Cleveland Clinic, the role as AOA secretary, both of those were very rewarding experiences. Uh, the AOA secretary role was maybe the first time where I realized I had some, some skill sets uh, and lacked many others to be an effective leader. So that, that was a really rewarding experience for me to be able to reflect on what I had as well as what I needed to be successful. And uh, what I enjoyed most about being AOA secretary was the opportunity to start some dialogue about uh, equality and, and diversity. And, uh, and I know those those efforts continue and have expanded, and it's wonderful to see the where the AUA is going along with all of organized medicine. Um, but obviously, a lot of work still to be done. But that was the most rewarding part for me in terms of the actual work as AUA secretary. And, and the second was getting to know many people across the world from different aspects of urology uh, that I otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to. Um, so going forward, I think engaging the next generation is going to be another critical thing to continue uh, for both the AUA as well as for myself. Uh, staying relevant in these changing times, whether it be the way people learn, the way people practice, and the way people place priorities in terms of uh, their own wellness uh, and the work that they do. And then it's been very rewarding to, to branch out a little bit into humanitarian work and, and other social issues that are facing our, our culture at this time. So I wanted to just quickly go back to one of the comments you made about reciprocal learning. And I think that is so important. I think as we are looked upon as leaders, we do need to self-reflect and realize how much we're learning from others. We're learning how to lead. We're learning how to speak. We're learning how to structure learning. And we're learning to receive feedback which makes us better leaders in the future. I, I think that leadership is, is a bit challenging, especially in these days. There are cultural divides, there are generational divides, but I, I really appreciate the fact that you have a very wide breadth of, of knowledge, of leadership skills in a lot of different situations. And in your career, sometimes you've led by authority but other times you haven't, especially when you were volunteering. Can you kind of comment about some of your humanitarian efforts? Jennifer, yes, I'll absolutely uh, talk a little bit about the humanitarian efforts, but first wanted to reflect on something you said, which is that in addition to learning from other people, I've also realized it's very important to learn from myself and my failures, uh, because there are times where I've taken the wrong approach, uh, haven't communicated well, um, and, and so each of those experiences are very important from a learning standpoint, not only in terms of trying to address and rectify the issue in a meaningful way, but also trying to avoid those issues in the past, in the future. So uh, with regards to humanitarian efforts, uh, my grandfather in India uh, had a surgery when I was a kid, before I knew about urology or medicine. And uh, it was a surgery on his prostate. And my dad told me about it and how a team from the US had gone over and operated on my grandfather. And uh, it was a heartwarming story, but I didn't realize till maybe 15 years later that I would meet the man who did the surgery, Dr. Bedlani. Uh, so, so there are many leaders in our, in our field, Dr. Bedlani, Dr. Das, Dr. Thomas, uh, Dr. DeVries, many who've really made a huge mark on humanitarian efforts. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so Dr. Badlani was the first one who engaged me to, to help in India. Uh, 
And those were very rewarding trips. Uh, I think as many people who go on these trips know, it's we come back probably with more in terms of our own heart being full uh, as opposed to what we take there. Um, but the, uh, the other thing is to always focus on beyond the one week, what can we do to make it sustainable? How do we educate so that uh, the knowledge that we're bringing over can stay there rather than coming back with us? Um, more recently, uh, we've been inspired by uh, Laura Bukovina, a uh, Ukrainian urologist who now works at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, her efforts in Ukraine, and through her, have had the opportunity to go there on three occasions to help in a variety of ways. I think that's amazing. And one of the things you said is just you're leaving behind the knowledge. You're not just coming, doing, and then creating a vacuum. You're purposely building leaders that can continue the work. So I appreciate that. I really do. Well, are there any closing remarks or any takeaways you want to leave for our listeners? Well, I, uh, I do feel that leading by example is, is probably one of the biggest things. And uh, I think most leaders do that. Uh, and by example, it means trying to do your best whenever you can, which is, should be always. Try to be true to yourself, open doors for others, don't overcommit, and try to choose things that align with your purpose and passion. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Munga, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Jennifer, thank you, and thank you to your audience for listening to us. And thank you, audience, for joining us again today on the AUA Leadership and Business Podcast. Until next time. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, Make AUA Leadership and Business your go-to podcast. Subscribe today by searching AUA Leadership and Business on your favorite podcast app and enhance your leadership and business education needs.